Hey guys, this video is on quantum numbers, orbital diagrams, and electron configurations. All right, so quantum numbers basically just describe the location of an electron in an atom. And there's four different quantum numbers we're gonna focus on. There's N, L, epsilon, M sub L, and M sub S. Uh, having a complete set of four quantum numbers in hand basically gives an electron's address, you know, where it lives, where it resides, uh, kind of like its home. Um, the idea with this is that no two electrons within an atom can have the exact same set of all four quantum numbers. Okay? And this is what we refer to as the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, we're going to come back to this kind of uh, bulleted point here. Um, but when we talk about orbitals here in a few moments, uh, it's important to note that an individual orbital may only hold two electrons max. Okay? Uh, and this is going to kind of tie into the Pauli exclusion principle. So the first quantum number we're going to focus on is n. Um, and when we talk about n, we talk about the principal quantum number. Okay, And again, don't really get hung up on these names. Uh, bottom line is n is basically what we've referred to as the energy level, right, or, or the shell. As far as these n values go, we're always going to be talking about positive whole numbers. And what we're really describing is the size and energy of the atomic orbital that the electron is contained in. Okay, so size and energy. Uh, as far as size goes, uh, we're gonna see that as n increases, the orbital becomes larger. And that the electron is going to spend time further, uh, more time further away from the nucleus. And I have a nice little picture down here, uh, kind of the familiar, kind of a crude Bohr model sketch, which the, the Bohr model is kind of obsolete, but nonetheless has some utility. Um, and what we see here is that this first energy level, right, that's n equals 1. And then the second energy level, we have n equals 2. Third energy level, we have n equals 3. So, again, as we've labeled these before, now we're just taking an n to it, okay? The other thing to note is that as n increases, the electron becomes higher in energy. Uh, we'll get into the mathematics of this, actually, about two days um, the idea here is that as we go to calculate energy, it basically just becomes less negative. Again, we'll get into the mathematics here uh, in a few days. Okay. Um, so I've already mentioned this idea of you know, atomic orbitals uh, a couple times already. So I guess the question would be, what is an atomic orbital? Uh, bottom line is, it is an area of probability where an electron is likely to be found. And the way that I've always kind of thought about it is a ceiling fan at high speed. Okay, if we were to look at a ceiling fan, we may not be able to tell where an individual blade is. However, like we're gonna know that that blade is confined to some flight pattern, right? We know it's kind of general location, uh, but because of the rate at which it's moving, it's tough to kind of pinpoint exactly its position, okay? Uh, and these, these atomic orbitals, if you recall back to Anders' chemistry, one of the scientists you maybe studied was, was Schrodinger. Uh, so they're all kind of modeled after his mathematical equations. Okay. Uh, the second quantum number we're going to talk about is angular momentum, or the quantum number L. Okay. Again, don't get hung up on the names. Uh, when we talk about L, what we're really talking about is subshell, or sublevel, is the terminology that we're going to try to you know, commit to in class. Concerning values here, um, for any uh, value of n, okay, we're going to find that L is going to start at 0, can become 1, 2, or again, really any positive whole number, all the way through n minus 1. So for instance, let's say that we have an n value of 3. Okay, so just a quick calculation here. Uh, per the formula here, you know, L is going to equal uh, or have allowable values through n minus 1. So L in this case can take on values of zero, one, and two, okay? Uh, that being said, if we have say an N equals two, we know that L can only take on values of zero and one, okay? So what this angular momentum quantum number really describes is basically just the shape of the orbital that the electron resides in, okay? And we're gonna get to this here in a second. Um, but basically, we're just talking about the very familiar S, P, D, F type orbitals, okay? So we're going to come back to this in just a second here, okay?
okay? Uh, when we have an L equals zero, this is our familiar S orbital, okay? When we have an L equals one, these are our P-type orbitals. And uh, I've drawn a depiction of all three of these. These are like those, you know, figure eight type lobes. Um, and you might guess, and we're gonna see here in a second, that L equals two is going to be a D-type orbital. So if we go back here, what this is suggesting is that in the second energy level, okay, we are going to have both S and P orbitals. And in the third energy level, we will have S, P, and D orbitals. Okay, and you may remember this again from honors or regular chemistry, that we don't really start to get to D and F orbitals until higher energy levels, right? When we're that close to the nucleus, when N is say one or two, we just don't really have that much room for electrons, okay? Um, so bottom line is as N increases, we start to add more orbitals, where eventually, uh, as we get to say L equals uh, three here in a second, uh, we're gonna find that we see the introduction of F-type orbitals, okay? So again, L equals two, two we just saw that a moment ago, D-type, uh, L equals three of F-type. Uh, the shapes of these are a little complex. Uh, they're not, I mean, terrible, um, but I'm going to update a document to Canvas that you guys can peruse. Uh, let's take a look at the shapes for D and F, okay? The next quantum number I want to discuss is that of the magnetic quantum number, okay? Um, when it comes to the magnetic quantum number, um, all we're really talking about is how many uh, of a particular subshell there is, okay? As far as allowable values goes, once we've solved for N, and once we've solved for L, then M sub L, again, the magnetic quantum number, can take on values of negative L all the way through positive L, okay? Again, kind of sticking to whole numbers there. So the total number of M sub L values is going to tell us the total number of orientations that a particular atomic orbital has in 3D space. It's a little wordy, stick with me, let's take a look, okay? So let's say we have a value of L, that's zero. M sub L is also going to be zero, okay? Um, and what that means is that for an S-type orbital, there's only one orientation, right? We just have our familiar kind of S orbital. Now, when L equals one, the allowable values for M sub L, again, going back to this equation, would be negative one, zero, and positive one. There are three numbers listed here. And as a result, there are three orientations for the P-type orbitals that we just saw you know, kind of a moment ago. Okay, and all these are, like they're just lying in different planes, okay? When we get to L equals two, uh, we find that we have five different allowable values for M sub L. Uh, again, we have five orientations for D type orbitals. And when we get to L equals three, we find that there are now seven. If you recall, there are seven orientations for F type orbitals, okay? So again, don't get hung up in the terminology. Um, I'm not gonna hold you accountable for you know, kind of describing you know, everything that's going on here. If you guys are taking away the idea of energy levels, of subshells, and then having a quantum number in N sub L that describes you know, how many of that subshell there are, I think you're in really good shape, okay? Uh, the last quantum number is pretty easy to digest. It is M sub S. This should be relatively familiar to you guys. Uh, this is the electron spin quantum number. Uh, it can have allowable values of plus one half or minus one half. And literally this is uh, describing the spin associated with an electron, okay? Uh, you'll see that described as kind of say clockwise or counterclockwise as it kind of spins on an axis. That'd be kind of a particle view on things. And even that isn't entirely conceptually accurate, okay? But this, what this fourth quantum number really allows us to do is you know, if we have the other three in hand, it allows us to adhere to the Pauli exclusion principle, okay? Um, if we already have, say, two electrons we're comparing, and they have the same three previous quantum numbers we've discussed, well, this fourth one is going to differentiate them, okay? So we can you know, uniquely talk about, say, a single electron. We're going to shift focus a little bit, and we're going to get into what's called orbital diagrams. Again, should be relatively familiar to you guys. 
Uh, before we really kind of dive in, there's two considerations I want you guys to think about. The first is what we call the off-ball principle. The idea with the off-ball principle is that electrons prefer to be in the lowest energy state or the lowest energy level possible. Okay. Uh, the second consideration I want you all to consider is Hund's rule. Uh, we talk about electrons as occupying these orbitals, okay? Uh, but let's say we're talking about uh, a p-type orbital. Well, there are three p-type orbitals, right? There's uh, three of the p-type subshell. Um, and the way that electrons kind of fill these up is that they're going to enter uh, one of these at a time until each one contains one electron with parallel spins uh, before doubling up. Again, a little wordy. Uh, that being said, we're going to see both of these principles, or principle and rule rather, uh, kind of in action here in a second. Okay. So right now we've discussed the Pauli exclusion principle, the off-ball principle, uh, and also Hund's rule. All right, let's get to it. Uh, so as far as orbital diagrams goes, this will probably look pretty familiar to you guys. Okay. Uh, so what I have here is the uh, first energy level. We have an S subshell, second energy level, S subshell, so on and so forth. This axis here is going to reflect energy. So energy is increasing. Um, if I kind of move this up a little bit. Uh, the nucleus right, is kind of like right here. Okay, so we're really close proximity to the nucleus. As we move up in energy levels, again, we are moving away from that nucleus. So what we want to do is we want to find a way to talk about six electrons. Um, and kind of following these rules, the first, the off-ball principle, electrons are going to be, you know, filling uh, the lowest energy level and the lowest uh, subshell uh, possible. So we use these single-headed arrows to represent single electrons. We're going to slot one electron in. A second electron will go in. We still have four more that we kind of need to attend to. So there goes the third, the fourth, here's the fifth. And now this is where Hund's rule comes into play. Okay, this is the perfect example of Hund's rule. Rather than the second electron going right here in opposite spin, because electrons that are within the exact same uh, say orientation of a subshell, have to have different spins. Instead, it is going to spread out. So we would occupy a, another P-type orbital, or subshell rather, and then even a third type subshell, should we require that, before we look to double up. Okay, before we look to double up. And we'll notice that these have parallel spins here. Okay, so that's Hun rule, Hun's rule in kind of a nutshell. Um, let's take a look at another example. Let's say we have oxygen, okay? Um, so oxygen now has eight electrons. So adhering to the off-ball principle, we go one and then two, again, opposite spins. Otherwise, we'd be violating the Pauli exclusion principle. They have to have opposite spins in order to have four unique uh, quantum numbers. So it's one, two, we have three, four, five, six, seven. And it's only after these have been individually or singly occupied do we start to double up? Where again, that eighth electron that was just added has to have an opposite spin to have a unique uh, kind of set of directions or a unique address in terms of having four different quantum numbers there, okay? So um, orbital diagrams are great, right? They're useful, they talk about the energy of electrons and where they're kind of housed in terms of energy levels and subshells. But in electron configurations, we actually have a, a simpler way to describe the arrangement of electrons, okay? So let's actually take a look back at the orbital diagram for carbon. Okay, so this is what we saw. And this electron configuration should look pretty familiar to you guys. It's basically a, a simpler way to describe the exact same situation. Okay, so what we find is that within this first energy level, right, within as far as quantum number n goes, we see that there are two electrons. And that's what this denotes. So we're talking about n, the energy level. We're talking about the subshell in play, or the quantum number L. And then this superscript here is representing the number of electrons in that subshell, right? So we have two electrons within that 1s kind of location, okay? Uh, I've done the same thing for 2s. I've done the same thing for 2p, where I only have two electrons 
you know, spread out among those two different orientations there. Uh, what we'll notice is that the sum of the subscripts is going to equal six, right? And that's because per carbon, we know that for that neutral atom, we have six electrons, okay? Now this is kind of a lot of work, right? To come up with the electron configuration from an orbital diagram. So the question becomes, what about the periodic table? Is there a better way to very quickly determine electron configurations? And there is, and there is. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, bear with me while I, um, while I kind of modify my camera a little bit. It's gonna take just a quick second. Let's see if I can get everything in here. I have to kind of slide it up. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see here. All right. Looks like we have a complete picture now. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, what I've done, actually, let's put this over. All right, that works. So, what I want to do is I want to use the periodic table to talk about the electron configuration for bromine. Okay, and see if there's a good way to do that. Right, it's even a little bit bigger yet. Awesome, okay. Um, and there is, there's a really easy way to use the periodic table to come up with the electron configuration for bromine. Um, what I've done is on this periodic table, and we'll do this in class tomorrow, is I've labeled different blocks of the periodic table. So these two columns here are going to be what we call the S block. That's just to say that the valence electrons of those atoms will be retained in S type subshells. These 40 transition elements here, they all fall under our D block. Uh, we have these six columns across that constitute the P block. And down here in the, the lanthanoids and the actinoids or the lanthanides and actinides, um, we have the F block. And what you'll notice is that while I've numbered these rows one through seven going down for the S block, Things get a little bit weird uh, for these D subshells. If you recall from several moments ago, we find that uh, the D type subshell isn't actually introduced until the third energy level. And down here with the F subshell, we see that's not introduced until the fourth energy level. Okay. The way that I kind of treat this is almost like a typewriter, right? Like I always start um, kind of up in this location. And I just write my electron configuration kind of moving across. So I start here in the first energy level in an S-type orbital. I can start to kind of write this down here. So first energy level, S-type orbital. And going across, I would put in, say, two electrons. And just like a typewriter, we get to the end and we're like, Ching! and then we start back over. It's a great sound effect. I'll try to do more of those. Um, so now that we're in the second energy level, we're still back in that S-block. We'll go two electrons across. We slide over to the P block, still in the second energy level here, so 2P, and we are going to fill that with six electrons across. Okay, so we pick back up here with the third energy level, so 3S2 electrons. We slide over yet again. We're in the um, third energy level still, uh, six electrons cross. We slide back here. So we're back in the fourth energy level, S block, two electrons across. We get into our, it's kind of weird, but we actually go back down to the third energy level. The implication here is that that D subshell in the third energy level is actually of higher energy than the S subshell in a fourth energy level. We fill 10 across. We get to the 4P level we find we go one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so this is like the complete electron configuration for bromine, and that took a fair amount of work, right? So imagine that there's a better you know, system for this, maybe an abbreviated system, and we're gonna get to that here in a second. Um, the one thing I wanna point out is that when we talk about valence electrons, those are the electrons that are found in the outermost energy level. So in this case, in the fourth energy level, we should recall that bromine has seven valence electrons, okay? Um, every other electron that's present, so through here, even those, those 10 electrons in that uh, 3D area, those are all what we call core electrons, 
Okay, so quick distinction there. So again, using the periodic table, we can actually make this uh, a pretty straightforward, uh, pretty efficient uh, kind of task. Let's take a look at one more. Uh, and this is what I was talking about as far as like this becoming, you know, kind of a, a daunting task, right? Imagine that we wanted to come up with the um, electron configuration, say for lead, right? Uh, with 82 protons, right? That's its atomic number, which is to say it's gonna have 82 electrons. Um, that'd be a lot, right? We'd be sitting here writing for days. So there's a different system, right? This is the element we're looking to describe. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna abbreviate it in terms of the nearest noble gas. Um, and we're not gonna use radon in this case. We wanna use the noble gas immediately preceding it. So whatever element we have in question, we're just gonna go up and over. So it's gonna be the noble gas that's the one right before it, right? It has to be smaller if we're gonna kind of use it in a substitutive type fashion. Um, so we'll start by writing our configuration um, with the nearest noble gas, again, but it has to be smaller. So xenon in brackets there. And then we pick back up right there, sixth energy level, S type subshell, we're going two electrons across. In this example, we don't immediately go from the 6S over to the 5D. You have to remember that these lanthanoids kind of get slotted in right there. So after 56, we got to kind of jog down to 57. We pick up all of these. So we're talking about the 4F level that can accommodate 14 electrons. Then after 71, we're right back up to hafnium here where we attend to the um, the electrons in the 5D level. We slide over to the 6P, and that terminates with a 6P2, okay? So again, if we're looking at this, we would say that we have four valence electrons for lead there, okay? And this is its uh, noble gas notation or kind of shorthand as far as uh, electron configurations go. Thanks, guys.